In October 2021, I purchased a Pump It Up GX arcade cabinet. For those that aren't familiar, Pump It Up is a dance game. It's adjacent to Dance Dance Revolution. My cabinet was originally manufactured in 2004, and it needed a lot of work. And because I was the new owner, it was my responsibility to get that work done. This project was incredibly impulsive. I had no idea what I was doing. I've never done any restoration work before. With that all being said, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I learned a lot. It was incredibly satisfying. This was a super fun project, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. Alrighty then. Let's get started. Right now, the part that I'm stuck on is I need to uh, get these panel screws out, but most of them are stripped to the point of being completely destroyed. I've tried all different uh, screwdriver bits, all kinds of things. These screws will not turn. What a lot of people suggested online as a solution to this problem is to use a Dremel with a metal cutting disc to essentially cut a flathead divot into the rusted screw so that you can get enough surface area to extract it using a flathead screwdriver. But there was also another suggestion that ended up being so elegant that I didn't end up using the Dremel at all was getting a pair of van pliers. They're called that because they're pliers that have teeth that are specifically meant to grab onto the heads of stripped screws. Now, the ones that I got weren't brand name vampires, but they're functionally identical. I just want to say that extracting these screws with the vampires is probably one of the most satisfying things I've ever experienced in my life. Just look at this. Okay, so next we gotta talk about the mouse. Oh my god, the mouse, okay. When I went to go pick up the Pump It Up cab, I discovered that it was being kept in a sort of garage, sort of shed kind of thing. It didn't have doors, it was just like open to the outside world. And it turns out that a mouse uh, discovered the Pump It Up pads and decided that he wanted to live in there. And live in there, he sure did. He made a little nest in there. I can't even really blame the guy. If I were a mouse, I would want to live in there too. It's got all these pathways that you can walk, like a little labyrinth. I am very happy that the mouse ended up being completely unharmed by me throwing the pads onto a truck and then taking them miles away. So we got the pads off the truck and then put them in my apartment. And he chilled out in his nest for an entire day before finally leaving and trying to go scavenge for food. You know, scavenge for food inside of my apartment. And that was how I learned that the mouse existed. Like, I didn't even know that he was from the pad. I just thought he got in from outside somehow. It was only when I was able to remove the stripped screws and find the mouse's nest that all the pieces started to fit together. And I realized the adventure that this mouse has been on. The mouse was absolutely adorable. I wish that we could have kept him, but we didn't have a place for him at the time. Instead, we just ended up releasing him. He probably wouldn't have had much fun living in a glass box in our apartment anyway. Cleaning, 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 cleaning. I feel like that was most of what I did for this entire process. Any public facing arcade cab that's been around for multiple decades is going to be extremely dirty, especially if the game in question in involves a gigantic steel controller that you're supposed to step on. For the first few days, the cleaning process was essentially vacuum as much as I could until the vacuum got full. And then I would empty it, and then I would fill it again, and then I would empty it. Fill, empty, fill, empty, fill, empty. Vacuum cleaners are kind of expensive. We had two different vacuums, but they were both kind of small. I'm sure this process would have been a lot easier if I had like a shop vac or something, but I didn't have one of them. Now, vacuums are only really useful for getting like dry gunk out of there, stuff like dirt and dust. But a lot of the cleaning that I had to do was like bathing a lot of the parts straight up, like putting them in the bathtub and like scrubbing them with a brush and soapy water. Cleaning isn't really difficult. It just takes a long time and it can be really tedious. I always end up having fun cleaning things. It's like a nice Zen task that I can do while I listen to YouTube videos in the background. Oh yeah, and also uh, cleaning up the mouse nest was really fun. So one of the previous owners of these pump it up pads uh, had already spray painted the heck out of one of them, like totally went to town spray painting it. Uh, they made this horrible design it just looks awful. I tried scraping it off, no go. It was so bad, it was so bad. And that sort of put this green light in my head of being like, oh, cool, I should do like a spray paint job on this. That would be neat. So I made this color plan. I bought like a whole bunch of paints. I have very little experience in painting and spray painting and all that. So I thought I'd give it a go and have it be a learning experience. Uh, yeah, I came out the other end. Uh, it was certainly a learning experience. Um, I wish I had done a lot more research ahead of time. I wish that I had reached out to more people before I just went and did 
did the spray can job, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I just like jumped headfirst into it and just expected that everything would be fine. But this is the aftermath, so you get to learn from my mistakes. I shouldn't have been using a spray can in the first place. Do not spray paint something like this. Basically, painting steel is a lot more difficult and complicated than I expected. A pump it up pad needs to be rugged. It needs to be something that people are able to step on a lot without having to worry about the paint chipping. This is something that needs to be powder coated. There are ways to do powder coating yourself DIY, but if you have a body shop or a powder coating place near you, I just recommend getting it done professionally because then you can just get it done once and you never have to think about it again. But in my situation, I had two pads that were covered in garbage spray paint, one from a previous owner and one from me being an idiot. So you can't just take those to a body shop and be like, powder coat, please. You gotta get rid of what's already on there first. If you need to have something coated, but you gotta have a fresh start, just get it sandblasted. You can literally hire a person to blast high velocity sand at whatever you need to remove the paint from and you'd get a total clean start. It'll also clean up rust, which was a problem with my bars. The hand bars, of course, are one of the two most interacted with components of a pad. And after years and years of abuse, the paint was gone. It was completely rusted on the top. When I peeled the grip tape off of it, the paint just came right along with it. It was like, see ya, and it left behind this horrible rust patch. And the decals, or the stickers, that were on the side of each pad were completely destroyed. It left this adhesive residue that would have been a ton of work for me to remove, but the sandblasting made short work of it. And something that I didn't know going into it is that when you sandblast steel, you're removing everything, and that includes all of the layers that are there to protect the steel from rusting. So immediately after you sandblast, your steel is vulnerable to a thing called flash rusting. There's a lot of variables to it. It depends on where you live, depends on the moisture of the air, depends on how it's being kept. Essentially what I'm saying is that rust never sleeps. As soon as you get a thing sandblasted, you're on a race against the clock to get it coated before the rust gets to it. I had a 24 hour gap between receiving my sandblasted pads and going to get them coated, but that 24 hours was more than enough time for rust to start developing and I just got lucky. So now that we're at a clean start with the pads and the bars, they're bare steel. I took them to a powder coating place and that was my last chance to change my mind about the colors. My original plan, as I showed you earlier, was to have the pads be purple and the bars be pink and blue respectively based on my mascot character, KK. However, it was pointed out to me that I was accidentally copying Dance Dance Revolution because on Dance Dance Revolution white cabs, the bars are also pink and blue. I don't want people to think that I'm copying DDR on my Pump It Up cab. Those are two separate video games. So I ended up just going with the factory design of having the pads be white and the bars be red. It's an iconic design. It's very pretty. Having stock colors makes it easier to resell later if I decide to do that. And if I do decide that I want to customize it for myself, I can just make some custom decals uh, for the sides of the pads. And if I want to get rid of the decals, you can just peel them off and put new ones on. There you go. You remember earlier when I was talking about removing all of those horribly stripped and rusted screws? I obviously can't just put those back in, so I have to get some replacement screws. The situation that I was in after removing the screws with the vamp pliers is I would be holding a screw in my hand and I had no idea how to translate the thing that I was holding into something that I would be able to purchase on the internet. What do I measure it and then like search for the screw measurements? Like I don't even know where to start with that. What a lot of people suggested is like, yeah, just bring that screw over to like Home Depot, show it to an employee and then they can get you the screw you need. In order for me to do that, I would have to leave my house and I don't want to do that. My thought process was that the Pump It Up community is really big. Someone has to have done this research for me of like what screws go where and like where to buy them. I was absolutely right. I reached out to Nervash, who's a Pump It Up aficionado on YouTube. His videos were very, very helpful in getting me started. He gave me this Google Doc that specified all these different screw types and links to buy them and like where they go. Oh my God, it was so helpful. It saved me so much time. It is an extremely common practice for people to replace all of the top layer screws with countersunk screws. And what that means is that instead of a bump where the screw head is, it just sits completely flat. And I completely understand why that's a common practice because countersunk screws feel really nice to play on. The takeaway from this is if you get stuck somewhere and you just don't know what to do, just ask for help. You'd be surprised how many people on the internet are willing to jump to help you. So that's replacement screws, but what about everything else that I had to replace? Uh, yeah, there were actually a bunch of things. In the context of an arcade, a pump it up cabinet has two pad controllers that are connected together. The piece of steel that's responsible for attaching these two pad controllers together, it's called a joint bracket. You have one on each side, one on the front and one on the back. The previous owner only had one of the joint brackets. I need
need another one. You can't just use one. If you have two players dancing simultaneously, then the vibrations might cause the two pads to diverge. Your joint bracket's gonna bend. It's just not a good thing. You don't wanna do it. Some people will makeshift these in order to avoid having to pay the troll toll of getting a new one, but I bought it anyway because I wanted them to match and because I'm a stupid idiot. And uh, another thing that was missing, underneath both of the Pump It Up pads, uh, there are some legs and wheels so that you can easily move them around and keep them stationary. Neither of my pads had those. No legs, no wheels, nothing. Legs are more important than wheels because the legs keep it stationary. You really don't want your pads moving around while you're playing. It can be pretty dangerous. You're throwing your body weight around, you're moving really fast. You really don't want your pads moving out from underneath you. But wheels aren't really that important if you're planning on keeping it in one place. They're really just for like transporting it. So I went ahead and bought eight legs that day. But everything else that needed to be replaced, I just 3D printed, yeah! I'm lucky that my brother owns a 3D printer and knows how to use it because I am too stupid. I had him print a whole bunch of countersunk corner brackets and I also replaced all my sensor channels with this newfangled one that looks really cool. For 3D printing, we use two different kinds of filament, PLA and TPU. The basic difference is that PLA is hard and rigid and TPU is soft. You can like bend it with your hands. And the soft one's really good for something like a corner bracket where you're gonna be constantly stepping on it. You don't want that thing to snap. I brought up the sensor channels just a second ago, but I haven't actually explained what sensors are. <laughs> so uh, sensors are uh, the thing that detects whenever you're actually stepping on a panel. There's four of them in each panel frame. A lot of sensors in these pads were either missing or broken. I'm pretty sure I have 30 working sensors. Five of them are dead and five of them are missing. So I went ahead and ordered five brand new sensors. Here they are. They're beautiful. They're all wrapped in plastic and everything. The general strat that I've picked up on is that people will take all of the sensors out, test them one by one, and then order them by how sensitive they are. Least sensitive to most sensitive, right? And then use that information to determine where each sensor will go in the pad, right? Like the middle range sensitivity will go in the center panel and the inner corners of each of the corner panels. Your lower sensitivity ones can go on the outside since you're less likely to interact with them there. And usually people will just exclude overly sensitive sensors because nobody wants their panels to trigger too early or get false presses. After all of that work and all of that build up, it's still not done. I'm not even close to done with this project. Basically everything that I've done so far has been to service the dance pads. I haven't touched anything regarding the cab yet. And that's kind of scary considering how much of a money pit this project has been already. I'm not even halfway done and it's already cost over $2,800. But I feel that this is a pretty good place to stop for this video because I have a playable modded dance pad. It looks great, it feels great. And if you guys are interested in this restoration process, I would be delighted to document more of it. What they don't tell you when you get into arcade cab stuff is that it goes from being a solo project to being a group project very quickly. You know, you're reaching out to friends and family like, hey, who can help me lift this really, really heavy thing? Who do I know that has a truck that can help me transfer this from one place to another? And luckily there are entire internet communities of people that are willing to help you with arcade cab stuff. There were so many times where I was just completely stuck and I didn't know what to do next. And the Rhythm Game Cabs Discord had my back. Thank you to all of the users that are in that group. You guys were an amazing help to me. Thank you to all my friends and family that helped out with this project. Thank you to my lovely boyfriend, Luke, who probably did as much work on this project as I did. Thank you to everyone on Patreon, every single person. You guys have been keeping me alive for so many months and it really means the world. I wanna shout out a couple of YouTubers, uh, Nervash, Alex Diner, Happy Feet, Fefems. Oh yeah, and uh, Pump It Up P.O., definitely. Gotta watch Pump It Up P.O. This guy, he plays like 20s. He always labels them no bar and that's not wrong, but it's, it's because he can't can't reach the bar, he's too small. <laughs> it's friggin' bonkers, you gotta watch it. Your homework is to check out some of these YouTubers and leave some nice comments. While I was editing this video, I kinda fell in love with the mouse, and I'm sure that a lot of you did too, so I got Shamu to make this lovely sticker that you can purchase right now on clue.gg. But yeah, that's it. Uh, I'll see you guys in 2022.